In the time of COVID-19, delivery bikes are now the king of the road. Home delivery was previously viewed as a luxury, but now delivery bikes from Food Panda, Deliveroo, Grab Food are all essential services, and millions of people rely on them to get the food that they need to bring to the table. So, Petrina, I want to ask you: um, Has how has food delivery usage changed for you during the the pandemic? <laughs> Interestingly, I think I found that um, we we try and deliver less now. Because we we also are very cognizant of the wastage with all the packaging material. So in fact, so so my cooking, as you know, if you follow me on social media, has been up to several levels. <laughs> no, I mean I just have to provide for a family, so I cook a lot more now. And um, uh, so if we do buy takeout, we 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 kind of use that as an opportunity to go and pick up the food so that we can kind of like work in a trip out of the house, you know, legitimately, right, as we're kind of being locked down. So yeah, I, I we try and deliver as little as possible if we can. And, and and if we can't, we just get stuff delivered anyways. Yeah. So yeah. On our end, it's been more of a, a special treat. Uh, we are eating uh, at home more and cooking for ourselves, which has been really good. Uh, mm -hmm. But for, for me, I, I'm one of the people who's had to celebrate their birthday in isolation. And so I took that as an opportunity to look for a, a special meal uh, that usually I wouldn't have had uh, uh, home delivered, but I was really quite surprised at what was available. It was a 12 course vegan Korean meal that was delivered to the door, you know, piping hot, and it was really quite amazing. So I was really quite uh, un, un, uh, awed by what was what was available. So yeah, there's some of the things that you do during during the pandemic. But I welcome, want to welcome everyone to another episode of Inclusively. Uh, in this series, uh, I'm, first of all, my name is Lorinda Garcia. Uh, in this series, uh, we are asking the question, how people are changing the way that they work or do business during the pandemic and what lessons that you've ha you have learned that have the potential to make the post-pandemic world more inclusive. Yeah. And hello, everyone. My name is Petrina. And um, this topic is very close to my heart <laughs> as a big food lover and food eater myself. So I'm very excited about today's episode because we have guests from all over the world joining us. And uh, we have some really uh, wonderful local heroes that I can't wait to chat with as well. So before we uh, kick off with the interviews, I just want to set, kind of set the tone here. So before the pandemic, you know, according to The Economist, you know, food was generally more affordable around the globe for, for people more than ever before, and fewer people were hungry than previous generations. So that's according to uh, the, the most recent edition of The Economist. But all that has changed because of the pandemic. Uh, as you've heard, there have been empty supermarket shelves and uh, wet markets due to the uh, panic buying during the early days of the pandemic. And now several months after, that $1 trillion a global uh, food supply chain has demonstrated its resi resilience with some really fast adaptations to made by companies. But all that being said, there are still some risks that lie in food security, uh, and less so on the supply side, but definitely on the demand side. Uh, it's no uh, surprise for people to hear that there have been massive job losses, you know, people have lost their income and have less money to spend on food. And the United Nations uh, just announced last month that they are worried that the number of people who were at risk of hunger has doubled as a result of the coronavirus. They are estimating that 265 million people are at risk of hung hunger now as a result of all of the changes that have been happening in the world. And an underlying threat in all of this is that there are high, there's a possibility of higher food prices if food food exporting countries start imposing export restrictions. So that's really giving us a big picture of uh, what uh, what is the subtext of our conversation today. Yeah, and also in today's episode, we'll be um, speaking with uh, two local food outlets on how they have adapted to the situation, um, whether or not they've had to endure sort of closures or how they've kind of responded to the community around them. And we'll also be hearing from a Singaporean living in London, a dear, dear friend of mine who's uh, also very involved with food and teaching low-income families there how to cook healthy and delicious meals for under a pound a day. We'll also be speaking to a pioneer for urban farming who's also joining, uh, and a social entrepreneur who's joining us from Australia. And later on in the show, we'll We'll be hearing from musician Joshua Simon. He'll be sharing his perspective on food during the time of COVID-19 and also offering us a song. 
Yeah, can't wait. But first, my absolute pleasure to introduce the one and only fabulous baker boy, uh, Mr. Juwanda Hasim. Hello, darling. <laughs> Hello, Katrina. Hello, Lorinda. <laughs> Yeah, so um, for those of you who are uh, from Singapore, you might have um, indulged in many of his cakes before. I think that's what he's known for, his legendary row shelves of deliciousness. Um, and his lovely cafe sits at the, at the bottom of uh, Fort Canning Hill. Uh, and I think he's definitely experienced all kinds of things, given the last three or four weeks of um, mayhem. So perhaps, Joanna, you could just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, you you were able to keep going and then you couldn't. Uh, How have you pivoted? How have you made sort of adjustments and changes? And how are you doing? So when when the virus first broke out, it wasn't so clear in January and February. I mean, February was coming uh, what the situation was going to be. Business was great because we're, we were not as affected as the malls or any enclosed space because we're, based, we're located in a park. So we're outside. So people were not enclosed in an area. There wasn't any air conditioning outside. People come into my area. So a lot of people still come, come with their families. People were still playing in the park. Um, uh, the averages started decreasing 10, 20 percent, but we were, we were still okay. Uh, then social distancing started, uh, and that <clears throat> really hit the. Uh, so sorry. Then the MBS tower closed. You know that that day, that day where uh, the, the the government just they, they closed the whole building just because one floor was affected. And then the next day, the repercussions was immediate because we had nobody for lunch. Everybody was made to work from home mostly because we were located near the business district, not so much the, the where people lived. Um, uh, so in that, when that happened, business dropped maybe 30, 40%. And then the weekend, we saw a resurgence, right? Because uh, people still wanted to come out. People were, were worried, but people needed to get out of it. So people still did their cakes. People still came out. And that was the first week. And then the second week, they implemented the social distancing. And that was immediate for us because we had a shot. We were not allowed to open until everything was checked by national parks. Um, thank God we have an extended space area, which was included the gallery. So my cafe is a, a, a very tight 60-seater uh, 60 uh, and a gallery space, uh, which is, was empty. We cleared out the gallery space and we made the space even bigger, which could fit about maybe 50 seats. Um, that went well. well. Um, at this point, we were, I was just restructuring. At this point, um, takeaways were still not a thing. Uh, people were encouraged, deliveries were encouraged, but it was still not a thing. I was just restructuring my takeaway business, online business. It was steady. It was growing. Um, and then um, uh, then social distancing the week after really hit. Uh, and I immediately went online. I put, pushed out 20% off cakes and $5 off the $5 delivery island-wide because I couldn't depend on the delivery uh, systems, which was like Deliveroo or Panda because they were too expensive and they did not service the areas that I needed to service. Um, and so my friend, uh, Rubina, who owned a wedding event company, said, take my van. And I got one of my managers to drive. And so that was our system. So we got the orders in and orders started coming in. It was a lot of takeaways. Uh, we were doing 21, 20, 30 orders a day. We had to call in for another, for another vehicle. And then suddenly the park was all shut. Immediately that night when they shut the parks, the next morning I had to reimburse 10,000. I had to um, refund customers $10,000 just that morning. Everything, overnight, everything was just shut. Um, And then since yesterday, some places, uh, most places are allowed to open, but places in the parks are still closed. So I'm just at home cooking for my neighbors, my my friends and stuff. So how it has affected me, it's affected me really greatly. I mean, I mean, I, I spent three days of my non-carb day just eating carbs, not knowing what the hell I'm going to do. <laughs> just three days, just filling myself with carbs. I really did like, you know, the first thing was to, to, to how am I going to keep my guys? I've got, I've got, I, I'm really not using my 15 part-timers. They're really, so poor thing. And then I've got um, uh, two cooks, two bakers, two, one manager, one barista, one guy on the floor. 
Um, three of them were foreigners. Um, how how do I do this, right? So that was my. It was it was kind of emotionally not great, but I, I worked through that. I had to do what I had to do. Um, things are things are better, but not as great as I wish it could be. Uh, when come when this lifts, uh, I basically have one more month before uh, my business shuts in Ju- in July. Only because of the lease, uh, we we're, we're finishing up the lease with national parks. And because of the situation, I haven't been able to look for a new space. I haven't been able to do anything. I've been talking to agents. I've been so everything. I'm my hands are tied. I can't even keep my guys on a retainer because I don't know when I'm going to start again. Um, yeah. You know, so basically, um, my first Zoom. This is only my second Zoom meeting. So my first Zoom meeting was telling all my staff we're shutting down in July. So the first week of July, Fabulous Picker Boy was shut down. And then we'll see what's going to happen. And then, then we'll see how. Because th- th- we can't, I can't do anything at this point. Yeah. Good Lord. I think that might be, is that news for everybody? Because it feels like this is big news. <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing this, that um, you're well, going to be I, shot in July. I think I, think I told you, I, I, I think I, yeah, yeah. I, I told you just in snippets, you know, and stuff, because yeah. I was really too depressed about just thinking about it because we were doing well. We were doing so well. I mean, yeah. just, and in, and in just three, just, I knew we were going to be badly hit, but I didn't realize it was going to be this bad. Yeah. It you know? it um, like so, just, yeah. Like pulled the rug from under you. Yeah. And- because I, I can't do any, I can't do anything. I can't, I can't go out and even if I have the funds, um, you don't know what the situation is going to be, how long it's going to stretch. It might be only clear next July, you know? Um, yeah. So what you're going to do? Well, thank you for sharing so honestly, Joanda. I mean, I, I think about all the various different restaurants that, you know, are pushing their takeaway menus out and trying their best. Um, uh, we, we have, thank you so much. I mean, we have another, uh, uh, you know, two guys who've come from a space that have managed to carry on because they're located, they happen to be located in an area that was not shut down. Uh, these are uh, Jason and Chen Long from Bangs Who Cook. Uh, hello, uh, Jason. I'm talking to Jason, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm Jason. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Jason from Bingo Cooks. Yeah, hi. <laughs> so, I mean, you guys are in a food center. So uh, if you guys don't know, uh, Bingo Cooks, uh, they do these lovely, delicious and healthy uh, f- food bowls at Hong Lim Food Center. They're very, very popular. And I think how I got to know you guys was because um, of, of some social media that was shared because of what you guys were doing in response to this uh, pandemic and which was that you were going to provide free meals for whoever who needed it. And as a result of that, I think uh, you had one of your customers start a foundation with you, right, called Bing Who Cooks Foundation, that basically started to provide these meals for free for all these people who you know, are struggling to even have a, a nutritious meal for themselves. So tell me what, what has been what has been like for you guys. I mean, I know you're at your stall right now. <laughs> um, basically, over over the whole thing, right? I mean, we are in a CBD area. I mean, Baker Boys should understand. In a CBD area, business has already been affected since Christmas, then later New Year, then Chinese New Year, then there's where COVID even comes in. So me and my partners, yeah. our pay card we has been taking maybe... I mean, we are a small store, so our pay card, we used to take like 1.5, 1.8. But nowadays, we just take $300 to around $200 a month. I mean, we, we, have, we are a food store. I mean, we can cook over here. Our, our meals are settled here. But overall, business has already been bad. And ever since the extension, right, the announcement of the extension of the date, right, the whole business has been crumbling around the whole center. It's just not our store. I mean, uh, also for like chicken rice store, those traditional Western food, even one, those one Michelin star food. They, they don't even have queue at all. You can just eat it. You can just come and order anytime, anywhere. They will just be able to serve you within five minutes. And their attitude has changed. Uh. I mean, sometimes last time they used to be very cocky. But nowadays, I think everybody is <laughs> desperate for business. Then they are all, oh, hi, hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, everybody is humbled down by this COVID. So sometimes this COVID, it shows a lot of humanity, uh, maybe to me, I feel. 
Yeah, I mean that's that's a good tip. Now I know I can finally go and eat my my soy sauce chicken. <laughs> no, but I mean that that's not the point. But I think also apart from that, um, do you feel like what what made you and your partner decide to you know start to do these meals for the community? It's basically because one of my friend uh, is because of this announcement of the COVID break. I think it was on six April before the announcement of the CBS started, right? He texted us saying that, uh, can we provide meals for needy people? And this was all before the circuit breaks even announced. Then I said that we have all we wanted to do this. It's just that we don't have the finance backing. And that's where he told me, okay, don't worry about the finance. Uh, you guys just do, I will figure out the finance. And then, of course, I'll be willing uh, because as long as I'll be able to work, I'll be able to come out of a house, I'll still cook. Now I'll accept it, I'll do it. Then initially, it started on... The first meal that I've given was on 8th, 8th of April. Then that's where... Uh, caught news of, like, you know, Fiona Sia, Channel News Asia, DJ Ross. Then that's where he start sharing. Then that's where the restaurant is overwhelmed. It start to, we start giving out around 80 to 100 plus a, a day of free bowls. Which I think is very unreasonable for the people sponsoring us for the meals. Because it's only one, one guy sponsoring. And that's like 600 plus, 600 to 700 dollars. And that's inclusive of delivery. And that's where we start changing and implementing a lot of different rules. Like nowadays, I will admit that, okay, I used to give around 80, 80 bowls a day. I was, now I only give around 30 bowls a day. Because there's a lot of people that are not suitable to accept this meal. You have people wearing Rolex coming down to take free meals from you. Yeah, that's how people are coming down to take free meals. Because we don't question them. Then, start, then that's where we start implementing the delivery charge. And those delivery charge will chase away people who are not really needy. Then when we see them, they are carry, they are, if they are carrying like branded bags or anything, right, we'll just chase them away. We are not even giving them away. But the main thing is, we are okay with giving them because end of the day is we just want, we just want to be able to ask us nicely because we have a lot of people asking free food, right? Like, hey, I demand you to give me this. I demand you to give me that. They use the word demand instead of uh, can I have a meal or anything. So we do reject a lot more than we give nowadays because we find that there's really people who need it more than most people that is being accepted by society. There's a lot of outcasts that Singaporeans don't see. I mean, I'm, I'm just curious because, you know, we, we, we also, I mean, for myself and my, my two friends, Janice and, and Pam, we, we started a foundation, well, uh, started uh, Pasa Glamour Art Aid. And even for something as, as simple as that, just even coming up with a form to try and sift out people who might sort of abuse the system was so complex, you know? So I can't imagine if it's just as simple as here's a meal. I mean, from a very simple idea of wanting to help, right? Um, it somehow brings out, you know, different all kinds of different people, right? Uh, so, you know, I think moving forward, like if you, if you just sort of if you would do it, would you continue to do this again or would you continue the, the foundation program uh, past the COVID period, you think? We will, we will. Well, like, we, I promised those people on our social media, like, our, especially on Instagram, we told that as long as being who could survive, right, being who cares foundation will survive also. Because these things interlink. It's just that we won't do delivery anymore. So if you want, you can just come down and at least tell us one day in advance so that we, we are expecting the guests instead of, like, if you come down, we will charge you, then you will say, oh, I have no money. And that will be very troublesome. So, as long as uh, they will keep, cook, operate right, we will keep we will keep giving out free meals. Because if you if ever if ever you ever did something right, you don't stop halfway. For me, I just feel that you, you do it do it all the way. That's wonderful. And would you? I mean, would you like the public to be able to help? Meaning, uh, with the foundation, can people donate to it so that they can keep the you know the support going? Uh, no, because really. Uh, I myself, I wanted to set up a, like a charity organization or something, but the procedure is not as easy as what everybody seems. If you want to donate money, right, when there's money issue involved, right, finance, it is on a different ballgame because that's why uh, I refuse to take any donations. Even for dry goods and dry supplies, right, like uh, rice and everything, right, I recommend do not give anything because we want to cater to a vegetarian, we want to cater to halal stuff, that's why if you give, right, we are not sure that your stuff is halal or your stuff is vegetarian. That's why we are avoiding people to donate money or even supply because it's just not fair for who we are feeding. So to us, if we want to bear, we will bear all costs on ourselves and our partners. 
Well, I just want to be on on behalf of everyone, say thank you for your wonderful, uh, you know, endeavors and your efforts. I think, you know, we just need to have more people like you, man, Jason and Jen Long. <laughs> we need more bangs. Yeah, there is, there is. After, uh, okay, maybe call me, call me humble break or something. I feel that after we start this foundation, right, there is really a lot of people copying this template. Uh, but it's, it's good uh, because uh, the number of decreasing males are also the sign of more people are helping. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it's the rejection that helps, but it's also more people are stepping up to provide females because there's a, even an like NUS student giving out 700 meals. There's an umbrella initiative giving out the meals. Yeah. So I'm glad that I don't know whether it's because of me or what, but it's a good thing that every Singaporean is stepping up their own ball games. Uh. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. And please, you know, continue. Good luck. Uh, I understand you have a food stall to run. <laughs> so if you have to run off, uh, I totally understand. But do stay okay. for the discussion if you're free. Yeah. Thank you, Jawanda. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Please stay on if you are able to. We'd love to come back to you later on in the conversation with some follow-up questions. Um, at this stage, I, I do. it's time for us to travel across the Atlantic uh, to, to London. Uh, where we have uh, Xiao Yan Chong on the line. How are you, Xiao Yan? <laughs> no, we're really thrilled that you were able to, to join this conversation. So um, I understand you're a volunteer. You've been doing a lot of work in London, uh, helping ensure that low-income families have better quality food on the table. And I would just love to hear a little bit more about how you exactly do that. So I volunteer with two charities. The first one is um, called Bags of Taste, and it's started in Hackney, which is where I live in East London. Um, and the aim of the charity is mainly to help reduce um, food poverty, which is kind of defined as people not having access to good food or food that's good for you, um, whether it's because of price or whether it's because they are in places where there are no great markets and they can't get to it. Um, and how it began was the founder was in a supermarket and she was looking at the shopping baskets of the customers. And so many people had like, you know, one pound pizzas or ready meals um, that are going at one pound in their baskets. And she was thinking to herself, she was like, oh, you know, I could teach these people how to cook a really nutritious meal for a pound or less. And that's how the story began. So Bags of Taste create, um, created a set of um, cooking lessons and then we have a set of recipes to go along with it. And basically every portion we cook is a pound or less. And when students come to our classes, they will cook and learn these recipes and then they are able to buy a bag of ingredients which are exactly measured out. So if it's one tablespoon of sesame oil, you will get one tablespoon of sesame oil in a sachet. So when you get home and you cook the meal, it will taste like what you've cooked in class, which encourages people to cook again. And once they get over that, like, oh, you know, why should I buy Singapore noodles, which is a very favorite, uh, like top favorite dish to order on takeaways for six, seven pounds when I can recreate it for myself at home for one pound. Um, and from there on, we reach out to um, the food banks in Hackney, the recovery service or so drug rehabilitation, alcohol rehabilitation, homeless shelters, um, a couple of um, domestic abuse places. And the council also has lots of council housing. So if you have families or residents who are in arrears, there are also people that we target or people that go to the job center because they're looking for work. And so... These are the people that we want to educate about the importance of budgeting, using measures when you're cooking so that you're not overspending and then your fruit tastes really great. And the, the thing that we do in our recipes is also encourage the use of um, spices so that people are looking at what they eat in terms of their salt intake and they're, they're able to make their food more exciting because of spices and herbs rather than adding sugar or salt or eating takeaway, which is full of sort of, you know, salts, fats and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's bags of taste. And, and through that course, we are able to reach out to lots of, a lot of them, I guess, who live on their own actually in Hackney, a large part of our 
um, a large part of our target audience live on their own. They're older, a lot of older men, 50 and over, who are lonely. And so the cooking helps them to reconnect with food, but gives them a chance to socialize in a very non-threatening situation, which is, you know, I think people always find it easier to chat over food, whether you're a man or a woman. And, mm -hmm. and then I'm supported by a group of other volunteers. So I teach the class and other volunteers will help each student in the class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in that way, yes, we are helping people by giving them cheaper food. But I think more importantly, the program drives behavior change that it's possible to cook better and your food is better than the takeaway. Right, right. And even if it means people eat like takeaway a couple of times less in the week, it, it means that we have achieved our objectives. Mm -hmm. And I think in this time of COVID, what we're finding, particularly in London, is that the people who are in the Black, African-American or Caribbean communities, they have a higher chance of um, dying from the disease simply because of obesity problems or because of their diet or genetic propensity. Mm. So having this idea of get, getting them to be aware of what they're eating and how they can control that kind of intake of salts and sugar, I think it's, it's, an, e it's an equalizer in that mm. respect. And do you foresee that any of the things or the, the ways of, um, you know, approaching behavior change in, in your work in, in London, is any of, are any of these things transferable for the Singapore context from what you know, what you see of the situation here? I think definitely. I think that the great thing about Singapore is I, I feel that growing up anyway, it's always been, food has been, it's very democratic in Singapore. The food that you buy in a hawker center, you know, now even with greater awareness of salt and fats, I think it's it's fairly healthy. It's actually quite good. It, you always get vegetables or something like that. It's it's so it's quite democratic. You can get pretty good food at a very decent price. And so I think that the practice that we have here of encouraging people to cook more often for themselves, I think that's probably something that should be encouraged. So that, yes, um, there's a you know, great chicken rice store we want to support and it's our local like downstairs takeaway. It's very good. We can tap out. But actually, how about encouraging people to sit down, reconnect with food and cook these meals? And part of the, the, uh, the way that our recipes are designed is that they are designed so that you can cook with one pan and on the hob. So you don't need oven. You don't need, you know, so you don't have to pay a lot for electricity or gas bills. So I think, you know, it's a really good way of getting people to cook together and reconnect with food. Do you, do you foresee that there will be a challenge? Because, I mean, it was interesting how you can make the comparison of how much a pre-made meal in the shopping basket would cost compared to making something for yourself. And in Singapore, I mean, you know, the cost of, uh, of uh, meals purchased at a hawker center is still quite reasonable. As you say, it's, it's very de democratic compared to the cost of preparing something at home for, for yourselves as well. There's, there's a kind of, I mean, some people talk about an imbalance depending on where you buy your ingredients. I mean, do you see that being a, 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 a challenge here in Singapore? Yeah, I think so. Not just in Singapore, I would say here as well. I think here maybe it can be a bit I don't know what it's like in Singapore, but it's kind of a bit judgmental. It's like, oh, you didn't buy organic. Or how can you eat chicken that is, you know, a pound 50 for like half a kilo? I mean, you know, but if you've got five children and you have to look after all the parents, you haven't got much of a choice. That's kind of what, you know. So I think bags of taste is good because it doesn't judge. But what it tries to encourage you to do is that in every, say in a recipe that actually has meat in it, if they are serving two people, and I'm just getting down to details, it would be less than 100 grams of meat per person. And that's how we always build our recipes. So you want to have meat? Sure. But it's 80 grams of, say, chicken, 80 grams of minced beef for one person. So if you make two portions, you know, 80, 80, that's 160. So when, people, when we cook with people, they look at it and they think, oh, my God, you, this, in this spaghetti bolognese, there's only like 180 grams of meat, everything else is carrots and celery. So I think in Singapore, you, you can do exactly the same thing where you teach people about the portion of ingredients that you put in a recipe, particularly the protein versus vegetables. And that will help you overall reduce the cost of a, a serving. 
So I, I think was, that's another way you can teach. Yeah, I would like to take that course myself because I tend to <laughs> over... Like today, I, I decided to roast a tray of vegetables and I realized I had roasted the entire head of broccoli, one whole carrot, one whole like cauliflower. And then the next thing I know, I'm like, I have like these two giant trays of vegetables that like my two kids just sort of like scoff at and then like, you know, open a pack of instant noodles themselves, you know? So it's sort of like, <laughs> ah, well... <laughs> I tried. <laughs> yeah. So at, at this point, I'd love to bring in uh, Bjorn Lowe into the conversation. Hi, Bjorn. Hello. I'm good. You're, so you're joining us from uh, Victoria in Australia right now. Did I get that right? That's right. And so I, I know you as a, a pioneer and a champion for urban farming. You're a co-founder of Edible Garden City. And, uh, and you know, a lot of this discussion, just the recent discussion with Xiao Yin, is kind of talking about uh, produce, p- encouraging people to to cook for themselves, talking about the cost of produce as well in a, in a city like Singapore. And I'm curious to hear what have been your thoughts as you've been in hearing not only the conversation but also your observations of of just how people are dealing with food uh, uh, against the backdrop of the pandemic um well it's definitely an, a very interesting time um for for everybody uh, especially in the food industry and in the farming space uh while, whilst there, there has been a lot of hype and talk around uh, food security, food sustainability, and Singapore being in a very uh, challenged position. Um, there's also a lot of chatter and news out from the global food supply chain. So you, you hear of farmers in the US, in, even in Australia, um, having to plow uh, their produce back into the ground because um, a, a lot of the food system is built on these centralized production system, massive systems of supply chain. So if something breaks, uh, everything goes um, to, to the ground. So farmers are, are actually losing a lot of produce. They are dumping milk. Uh, they are throwing away eggs because uh, the supply chain is broken. Um, and, and then on the, on, the, on the other end, you have people that are going hungry. So something is massively not balanced. Um, and, and this is potentially a good time to really look deeper into the food system on how we can balance that equation. Uh, a lot of the work that we have done in the past in urban agriculture is to look at decentralized production systems. So for example, we are in one HDB in, for example, in Amokyo, where we are producing food for the local community in the space that itself and not then reliant on a lot of outside um, um, you know, changes and things like that. So it's the local community supporting that that movement. Um, so so it, it is very trying times, uh, even for uh, the food producers as well. Um, although you see massive amount of demand from the consumer side, uh, that there is that um, inability for the farmers to bring their produce to market because of um, how the model has been built up on efficiency and because there is no efficiency now a lot has been lost uh, through this whole crisis Mm -hmm. so um, i'm just curious going back to you were mentioning before about your work with the heb estates and uh among among in particular and i'm curious pre-covid19 what have been some of the headways get you know uh, stopping for more heb estates uh getting involved in a project like that so in in the past we I think urban agriculture has always been a very challenging industry as because agriculture is based on the economies of scale uh, model. Um, while in urban spaces, you know, it, it is small and there's only that much you can go vertical. So scalability is always a challenge for us. Infrastructure cost is high. Um, our model has always been to be produced, uh, producing for restaurants. Uh, and hotels, uh, you know, high value type produce on very short turnaround times. Um, what what we now need to, to look at is really kind of changing that model to really produce um, higher amount of scale for the larger population and the general public uh, on produce that they eat every day, you know, the bak choy, chai sin, but then competition as well from from uh, overseas, you know, in Malaysia, in Thailand, um, the produce are a lot cheaper. Um, and, and it's always, you know, our, our produce is always a premium. But what, what we found actually starting to 
to work a lot in this space um, in, in, for example, York Hill, where we started a project called Akong Farm. Um, we, we found that actually urban farming is not only bringing out tangible values like the produce, but also it hits on the intangible portion of community engagement, um, you know, bringing socially isolated elderly out from their homes uh, to participate in something uh, like ur urban farming, growing produce together, eating together. Um, it has so much more benefits in terms of mental wellness uh, than just filling your tummy. So so there, there is a lot more that, a lot deeper into it. But of course, the focus now because of a food, sh food shortage is then food production. But um, we want to look at the picture holistically. Yeah. And I love that because I, I'm, I'm also noticing with just, you know, anecdotally amongst my friends, everyone is propagating spring onions and, you know, growing their own garlic and, you know, tending to the herb garden. <laughs> and I myself have quite a successful sweet potato leaf situation happening, though we haven't quite harvested it to you know, fry one dish of sweet potato leaves yet. But but I think, you know, I think it's making people really sort of think about this, right? Rather than go to the, you know, market just to get one sprig of, you know, spring onion. It's like, hey, you mean it's so easy <laughs> to like propagate spring onion. Why didn't I ever do this before, you know? There, there, there is always two sides of that. Um, so you, you have one group of people who give it a go and they're like, wow, it's so hard. You know, my chili plant keeps dying. Uh, and it's like, why don't I just go to the supermarket? I spend $2. Uh, I get all these chilies whilst, while you are spending you know, four or five months of your life trying to get this chili plant to produce. Uh, why, why take that effort? But you have the other group of people that are like, hey, it, it is a very difficult process to grow your own food. And they, they value the food a lot more. And then that has then a, a latent benefit on addressing a food wastage problem. Because in Singapore, we, we threw away 700,000 tons of food last year uh, while importing 90%. So again, that disbalance, right? Um, so we see these kind of um, changes in, in a lot of young people uh, going through that process to, to say, hey, it is really hard. Maybe we need to appreciate a lot more what these farmers are doing overseas, you know, to grow our food. Let's try and waste less. So it has, it has, it can go both ways. So with that, I do want to kind of put, step into a solutions mindset for a moment um, uh, and ask both Xiaoyan and, and Bjorn to imagine that uh, you were bes bestowed with the power to change the food sector in Singapore and in Asia. And what would be the top three things that you would do well, as soon as you were given this power? And I want to like pass that to uh, Xiaoyan first. What, what are the top three things that you would do? Ration cards. If I had power for 100 days, I would put out ration cards so that I think households, you can only buy stuff that is on your absolute essential needs for 100 days. And then you will learn to be creative. You will learn to stop throwing things out and you will learn to check, to smell, to rely on your senses before you go, oh, this Spring onion looks a bit soft. I got to throw it out. The celery is a bit soft and you don't reuse things in ways. So I would introduce ration cards. And I th and only because I think that this whole COVID situation has amplified the inequality that are in, say, my household versus, you know, the households that I'm helping right now. I, I, I Because of bags of taste and other work that I do, I'm so scrupulous about food waste now yeah. but i'm sure before i'm probably as guilty as anyone else so i uh, i go ration ration cards okay ration cards great thank you so yeah how about you beyond the the one thing i'll do is uh turn singapore from a garden city into an edible garden city and yeah. pass a policy that we have and can plant durian trees all around our roads, mango trees, sour soap trees, and everyone have then free access to the food. Because that's not so hard to do, right? They're spending a lot of money by putting in these giant ornamental trees that cost thousands and thousands of dollars in you know, places like that. Why don't you just grow a fruit tree and so everyone can partake, you know, even the wildlife as well. So, so, so that, that's what I'll do, pass a policy and make that a reality. I want to vote Bjorn as <laughs> Minister of Food. Ah, you, you got me at Free Durian Man on the side of the road. <laughs> Everybody's clapping. I see all of these rounds of applause Everybody's on the Zoom chat. Everybody's up. clapping. Free Durian. 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, um, okay. For now, though, uh, thank you. I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank all our guests today uh, for coming on the show. Uh, but for now, uh, a, a very special um, a guest as well who's also joining us. Uh, and uh, he, I know, as a well-known voice on the radio. But when I searched him up, he also says he's a 25-year-old music-making, sushi-eating love machine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joshua Simon to the show. I do love a good love machine. Hello, darling. I'm pretty sure that was my Tinder bio from five years ago. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually turning 30 in a couple of weeks. So I'm so sorry you got the press release a little bit late. I I think you can just keep it there. Keep it at 25. It's okay. Keep it at 25. I'm going to be one of those. Okay. Yeah. I just stopped counting. I just celebrate anniversaries from here on, right? Um, wow. I have so many things I want to say from this conversation. Okay. Uh, first off, okay, Jonda, um, I have not had carbs in three and a half weeks. I've been on keto. I've been on this keto diet because it's sort of like my way of helping a friend's business. Um, she runs this thing called Keto Me, uh, which is like um, a subscription delivery service for like keto friendly food. And before that, I was vegetarian for three months. So to go from vegetarian to eating only meat is like insane. And I miss carbs. Like I'm a carbs person. So I will, I will eat everything in your bakery. Like in one sitting like i need rice in my life <laughs> right now it's serious okay and um yeah like i i'm gonna go try jason's food as well i was like googling like bingo cooks and like the food looks so good it's like it's like eating like salad bowls but in a hawker center it's like what i spent like 20 dollars for these kind of bowls with an like i'm a sucker for an onsen egg like your onsen eggs look amazing and it's like super overpriced in the morning. That's right. Only six dollars. Oh yeah. Unless I'm, you add in, yeah. I'm so there. I'm so gonna come to your store. And and like that was such an incredible like that segment earlier on with you was like Just remember yeah. to tell me whether you're paying or you're getting for the free bowls. I, I will definitely be paying. <laughs> I'll definitely be paying. Like the free bowl stuff just got me like so riled up earlier on. Like <laughs> Oh, this period. So many people want to beat up. Um, but yeah, that, that was really cool. Um, yeah. Hi. How do I fit into this conversation? Well, I mean, I don't know if you, I mean, you, you have some thoughts about uh, food and sort of where you want to go. Or do you want to just, just offer your thoughts through your artistry and sing us your song? <laughs> I mean, there's, I still have so many questions like for, for, for Yen Chong, like what is Singapore noodles? I see it every time when I travel, it's like we do not have Singapore noodles in Singapore. What is Singapore noodles? I know, makes my heart curl. Is it no, it's just got... It's bihun with the curry powder in it. Huh? And then, why? The budget it's bihun, got, is it? It's got turmeric and like uh, cumin in it as part of the mix. Yeah, it's strange. I suppose it's like breakfast yeah. bihun, but they, they forgot what spice and then they just anyhow add. You know, Instead of yeah. sambal, they go and put turmeric and cumin. So Voila. confusing. I, I have not, I've not done the delivery thing. Um, like I like going out to get food. I like like interacting with the people that I work with. Like I eat about the same, like I can eat the same thing every day and not get sick of it. You know, like there are like certain restaurants or cafes that I go to and like we hang, like I know, I know the people, the, the staff there and everything. So I like that interaction. Uh, I, I don't like just food showing up at the door. Like I only just signed up for like, like online banking recently. So I'm one of those like rare millennials that just do not trust the internet. I do not trust Amazon. Like I need to physically like pay. I, I still have vinyl records, you know? So, so I'm that person. Um, like it's strange. Cause like, I feel like my family, my family is not super well to do. Like we've always like struggled with like bills and all that kind of stuff. But then like of all things, I feel like during this whole COVID thing, I can see how spoiled we are like ridiculously spoiled we are. And like, like when we open the fridge, there's just so much groceries in there. Like my sister will do a run, my dad will do a run, my mom. And I'll come back thinking that, okay, I'm buying for the whole family. And the whole fridge is just like chock full of stuff. And the cupboards are, are filled with like, okay, there's like canned food. Why, why do we have canned food? We never eat canned food, but then we have like every ingredient, you know? So I've been challenging my family to just stop buying stuff and just finish what's in the fridge. Cause it's really annoying when I'm hearing about how people are not getting enough food, you know? And 
like we complain so much about our bills and then you open the fridge and everything is there. And then like, you'll, I'll hear like a family member complain about how they're hungry and like they're going on delivery. I'm like, go to the fridge, pick up a pan. All right. And I've been cooking. Okay. So I've been cooking and it's been dreadful. Like some people are just gifted. Like I watch MasterChef and I'm looking at these home cooks, like prepare these incredible dishes. Like I can't cook an omelet. Like I, you would think that with the right ingredients, things would just go well, but just something messes up. It's either like, okay, I burnt something or I put too much oil or like too little seasoning. It's just like, I just not cut out for this. So like one thing great is I, I do host the show at night. Um, on, on, on my radio show, like Kiss 92. So like what I've been doing is I've been sort of intermittent fasting, waiting till like later in the night. I pack something. I eat much later on. Um, I wrote a song called All I Want to Do early during this, um, when the fears of the pandemic started creeping in, mainly because I felt like, like even listening to this conversation, I feel like I, I, did not achieve much in life it's like at least you guys are like in it you know you guys are like in it and you're you're in the grime and you're like working through and trying to find a way to help and and i'm just like i sing like what what is the skill set you know like i you know so i felt really purposeless and what I started doing on my radio show is I started opening it up. I, I didn't think too much about, it's probably like super wrong for me to do this, but like I've just been like allowing anyone who has a business um, that's either like thriving or trying to keep their head above water, like come share your story. You know, like I have a friend of mine, Douglas Park, he has a hawker store called like Fishball Story, you know, and he's using social media to really, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he still owes me fish cakes. So um, he is using social media to sell his fish balls and he's directly like he's getting his friends to come help deliver. Like he's doing everything by himself, you know. Um, so that's incredible. Um, I, I heard that Nando's is, is giving out free food um, every single day till the 1st of June. And mm. just like Jason, they're not doing any checks, you know, just by good faith. If you need a meal, we'll give you a support meal. That's it. So feel free to come onto my show. Today, I have a friend, Lucas, who represents Singapore as a speed skater. And um, he is, he's not able to go to the rink now, right? So he is helping because he's super tech, tech. He's like super nerdy. So he's been like refurbishing laptops and giving it to kids who don't have like money to get like a new computer during this time when they're working from home or whatever. So he's been doing that, you know? Um, and every artist that I interview, like yesterday, I spoke with Haley Steinfeld. Uh, she is a pop star and like one of the youngest to be nominated for an Oscar. And I've been asking this one question, which is like, what is the role of an artist in a pandemic? You know, and it's interesting. Like I'm still gathering answers. Like her answer well, was think, about, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go, you go ahead. You finish your, her answer. Her answer was about how, I think she was still trying to figure it out as I was, as she was answering. Um, it was a pretty intense question, huh? I mean, no, I mean, I think because we had an episode earlier about artists and the role of artists, and I think uh, the, our conclusion from that, uh, if you want to listen, you would have listened yes, to yes. that first before this one. But basically, I think uh, d I, I want to encourage you and say, don't feel like you're not doing anything. You're doing heaps. You have a show. You're connecting with listeners, right? You're providing a platform and uh, and you're such a connector. So, And you are an artist. And I think for especially these times, the artists always lead the way, right? We we find ways, we get creative. And I think what, what I've observed with the, f the people in the food industry, because they're the ones that first hit and hit the hardest and the fastest, yeah. but they're also the ones who are the most creative and the ones who come back fast and nimble as well. Uh, everyone has had to really sort of dig deep and find all kinds of ways to really sort of pivot, you know, get together and... And, and I think it does bring out the worst and the best. And I like to think that I think, you know, it depends on how you look at it. Um, I think we, ha we have to allow for people to take that journey, no matter what it, what it is. But, right. um, you know, food is so fundamental, right? Um, and, and it, I mean, we, we can say, oh, art is like the last thing. I mean, like if, if we were to sort of do the whole, okay, now we're going to relax the, the one now. Okay, we can open the first stall is to open and what is bubble tea? <laughs> it's like, okay, like those things will open first, like whatever. But then the arts venues will be the last to open, right? So that's yeah. that's still 
way back on the thing. But food, food is always on people's mind. Food is always the first thing. So in a way, I think that that hunger or that that essential need is is so primal and is so uh, is really the, the the reason we exist. And we and like you say, food isn't just about filling a tummy, right? Even though sometimes on the, on the most essential level, that's what it is. But we've all talked about that communing, that coming together as a community, uh, even just as the dignity of being able to provide a meal for yourself, uh, especially if you live alone. I really find that that's it's really quite special. So I was just thinking, I think, you know, um, I would love for for learning how to cook and feed yourself and nutrition to be one of the subjects we learn at school. You know, so that Joshua will know how to make an omelet. <laughs> okay, so actually, in MOE's defense, I did, I did do food and nutrition. Okay, but I was also dreadful at that. Like, I made spaghetti carbonara by just getting like, um, like spaghetti from like the shelf at the supermarket, and then um, I use Campbell soup, like cream and mushroom, <laughs> as my carbonara sauce, and it's, um, it's actually pretty edible. It's really tasty. I have to. I, it I love is. <laughs> Don't thumbs down, Jason. Don't like, thumbs, no, thumbs down. I just gave you like a brilliant new item to add. Okay. No to Campbell's soup. Campbell's soup oh, carbonara. It was very interesting, actually. I have to say that um, a lot of people, when 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 the hoarding started, right, and people wanted to like panic buy and buy stuff, people who don't normally buy canned food just sort of to buy canned food like I know I was doing that I was like yeah maybe I need like a, a can of maling like luncheon meat now like you know it's like I never ever buy it but suddenly I have three cans and so I'm like what's all this and I still haven't cooked it and so so yes I'm guilty hoarder <laughs> yeah and a lot of people I mean like, I feel like dieting in a pandemic is such a privilege like everyone is just talking about the diets that they're on and like oh my gosh I'm gonna be so fat by the end of it I'm like you have so much food though like, I mean, I wish, I wish there was just better synergy. Like, I, like, I want to help, but the thing is, I don't know where to start. You know, like, yeah. I don't know what to do. Like, okay, great. I have all this food. I've got all this in my, like, can, can I start cooking stuff? Can I start giving it to someone? Like, who do I give it to? You know? So like, I, I just wish there was just like a better synergy or even, okay, like, great. I host a radio show. I can be a catalyst. I can help like draw people to these businesses, you know, uh, letting them come onto the show and promote your, your business and your product that usually would cost a lot of money. I just wish there was, yeah. once this thing starts, to engage us, engage the artists to you, help you out, can, you know? Is what I'm saying, Joshua. So it, do you, okay. um, before we go and, and have you sing us out, uh, any any last thoughts, Lorindo? Yeah, so I, I do want to make sure we t t touch base with each of our guests before we wrap up today's show. And really the, the invitation is to, uh, you know, share what is one thing that you want our listeners to know based on today's discussion? And perhaps we start with you, Jawanda. Uh, what's one thing that you'd like our listeners to know? I, I think, you know, out of the dark clouds and shit and stuff, I think there's still hope. Um, I'm, for one, so hopeful. It, it, I mean, brings me to tears, but I, yeah, just really hope um, things, will, things will get better. How about you, Jason? What's one thing that you want to make sure our listeners know based on today's discussion? Uh, I really want people to know that you know that there's a website, there's a Facebook group called COVID Idiots, right? Yeah, I just want people to stop. <laughs> but, yeah, put yourself into someone's shoes and stop shaming and scolding them. Uh, and then, because that's not really cool. Uh, because most of them that appears on the page, right, are the ones without social media. And they don't even know they are being framed or they are being scolded. Yeah, and then that, that's a very sucky feeling to be felt uh, if you don't even know you are, why you're being scolded. Right, so to have a heart. Lovely. And how about you, Yen? <laughs> Definitely reconnect with friends, you know, pick up the phone. Obviously, Zoom calls are great and all of that. But I think if someone that you want to speak to and you haven't spoken to them for a while, pick up the phone, do that, read more. I'm finding myself reading a lot and really enjoying um, walking the streets and really, I don't know, looking at trees a lot, looking at like, I can hear birds every morning more than I've, I have in a long time. And I, I'm really, I, I, I stop and actually take my time. So I think that's a, a luxury and I'm making the most of it um, and helping others whenever you can. Thank you. And to round us off, Fionn? Yeah, I think um, hope is definitely something that is really important to hold on to. Uh, and I hope everyone can continue to hold on to that. Uh, but on the flip side, I, I feel that, you know, Mother Earth has been very well 
uh, taken care of in the last uh, six months, you know, with all the emission has gone down, the flights being grounded. Um, perhaps I really hope that we can all look towards a better future with a, a better economy that is a lot more sustainable for the future. So that that is that is my hope. Great. Thank you so much to all our wonderful guests uh, who've joined us here today. And I think, Joshua, do you want to just tell us a little bit about the song that you're about to sing? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, This is a song called All I Want to Do. And it's a song that I think a lot of us can definitely relate to. It's uh, the desire for escapism. Um, It's also um, how I feel sometimes when I feel like I don't know where I fit in. I just kind of want to disappear and just like hide my head, you know. So like it's the song is about anxiety, but it's also about escapism. And um, it's colorful. It's fun. Thanks to all our guests, Joanda, Jason, Yen, Bjorn, Joshua. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with us today. If you'd like to find out more about our guests, please check out the Inclusively website. We'll be providing links to everyone. Uh, please remember to like this podcast and share a review. Your feedback will help us improve. Make sure you subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and also YouTube. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, until next time, I'm Katrina Cow. And I'm Lorindo Garcia. Thanks for listening. How I do this to feel so feather bad To one day take flight for once just get it right My friends keep telling me you You should be living for you What are you trying to prove? The more that you give, the more you're not in life It's not all there, it's you Who are you trying to fool? The more that you want it, the less you get up It's disappeared, it's disappeared Don't wanna, wanna be all I wanna do It's disappeared, it's disappeared Don't wanna be, wanna be here Don't wanna be, wanna be here I wanna wait If I'm not going back Listen each time I hurry back Sing never again I'm fixing the narrative I'm breaking the habit It won't be easy, no I don't want to get you wrong Things will never be the same You should be living for What are you trying to The more that you give The more you're not in it's not on balance. Who oh, are you trying? The one that you wanted, the less you get. Oh, all I wanna do is disappear. It's disappear. Don't wanna be, wanna be all I wanna do. It's disappear. It's disappear. Don't wanna be, wanna be here. Don't wanna be, wanna be here Oh, why don't we run away? Oh, run away <laughs>